Red blood cells, also called erythrocytes, actually sometimes they call them red blood corpuscles because as you will see in a moment, they are not actual cells. They were cells during their development and then they lose their nucleus. So they are no more cells, they are more like corpuscles. The white blood cells, the leukocytes, leuco means white, so the leukocytes, they are actual cells, they have nuclei, and you can differentiate between them according to the shape of the nuclei, according to the granules that are present in the cytoplasm, because they can be either granular, where you can see granules in the cytoplasm, or agranular, where you can differentiate between them according to the shape of the nucleus. The platelets are definitely not cells. They are fragments of cells. There's a very big cell located in the bone marrow, which is called mega. So it's not even, it's not a macro, it's mega karyocyte. It's so big. And fragments of the cytoplasm of that cell, which is present in the bone marrow, uh, they go to the blood and they form these disc-shaped structures, which are platelets. So definitely they are not cells. The erythrocytes, the red blood cells or red blood corpuscles, the normal count is 4.8 to, in females, 4.8 million per cubic millimeter. And in the male, it's a little bit higher in the male. And of course, this is per cubic millimeter, so it is not related to the size, to the average size. The reason here, the difference, because females, especially in the reproductive time of their life, they have menstruation. So they are Con continuously and constantly losing blood. So that's why the average number of RBCs is less in a millimeter, is less than that in the male. This will be also reflected on the percentage of blood volume occupied by RBCs. The percentage is 45%, but we didn't mention the sex. So it is more in the male, in fact. It is in the male, it's 47%. In the female, is 42%, the percentage of the volume of RBC in the blood. This is what we call the hematocrit. Reduction in the number of RBCs or the reduction in the amount of hemoglobin that they contain, this will reduce the oxygen binding capacity of the blood and results in a condition which is called anemia, which is either because of reduced RBCs or reduced hemoglobin, amount of hemoglobin, main reason of, uh, of anemia. This is the shape of red blood cell or erythrocyte. It's biconcave disc, as you can see. It is about eight micrometer in diameter. And this diameter is definitely larger than many of the tiny capillaries in the body. And because the RBCs have to reach all these capillaries, then you will expect these RBCs, they will uh, try to fold themselves in order to navigate through these capillaries. Being biconcave, in, in shape, this will help them easily fold. And there's another feature here that they have a good glycocalyx. The glycocalyx means glucose attached to the cell membrane, and this will absorb more water and make the cell slippery. So they are more slippery, and that's why they can navigate through the tiny capillaries. Being biconcave means that they, they are flexible in shape, when they pass in narrow passages, and also it increases the surface area per volume, so they can exchange more gases. How they become biconcave? Because they lose their nucleus. As they become mature, they lose their nucleus. Not only their nucleus, they lose all the other organelles. So they start with losing the nucleus, and then they will lose all the other organelles. So they, that's why they can become biconcave. And because they lose their nucleus, because they are always changing their shape, then any problem, any injury, any defect in the cell membrane or any defect in the cell in general cannot be repaired because they don't have the organelles, they don't have the machinery for protein synthesis, and they cannot repair themselves. So that's why they have a limited lifespan of 120 days, and after that, they are going to be destroyed. In addition to the fact that the glycolipids or the glycocalyx makes them slippery, they have certain glycolipids in their plasma membrane. These are the glycolipids, like this one here. Carbohydrate attached to the uh, lipid molecules, so making glycolipids. So these um, glycolipids in the plasma membrane, they form the uh, what we call the blood group antigens, either the ABO blood group or the RH recess 
RH, like uh, positive or negative blood groups. They are the glycocalyx, depending on the glycocalyx that is present in the wall of the RBC. So this is the life cycle of the RBC. It is produced in the bone marrow. There are precursor cells which are present in the bone marrow. And uh, they are, of course, they are nucleated and then they will be uh, released in, into the blood after they lose their nucleus. So the proerthroblast, as the name indicates, blast means forming cells. So we have proerthroblasts. They produce red blood cells. They lose their nucleus, become what we call reticulocytes. Reticulocytes are released into the blood circulation. And within two days, these reticulocytes stay in the blood. And then after that, they change into a, a mature RBC after they lose the remaining part of their organelles. So they, first of all, they lose their nucleus, they become reticulocytes, and then they retain some ribosomes and endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria. They are going to lose that as well and um, become red blood cells within two days. They circulate in the blood, and then once their lifespan is, uh, is done and they have a lot of defects in the cell membrane, they will become recognized by cells which are present in the liver and the spleen. These are residing cells, macrophages, and as elsewhere in many other places, then the structures that were used in the production of RBCs, most of them, they will be recycled. So as you can see here, that the cell membrane, the proteins of the cell membrane, and the globin portion of the hemoglobin molecule, because the RBC mainly contains hemoglobin molecules. So the globin is a protein, and the cell membrane is mainly formed of proteins. These are going to uh, be reused again for the production of new RBCs. And then the hemoglobin has a heme portion, and this heme portion partly is a pigment and partly is an iron ion. So again, these iron ions, which are present in one hemoglobin molecule, there we have four of them, they will be recycled back to the liver and reused again. And the heme portion of the, hemo of the hemoglobin, the pigment portion, is going to be changed into what we call biliverdin and bilirubin and excreted in the bile. So this is the, reason, this is the part that's going to be the, uh, get rid of the bilirubin. The, uh, pigment part of the hemoglobin, and it's not only, it's not only uh, just excreted as waste, but this bilirubin is very important, the bile pigment is very important for the absorption of fat from the small intestine. So it, it, again, it serves uh, some other function before it's going to be excreted. So worn out cells are uh, removed by macrophages, and all the breakdown products are recycled. Whether protein, whether the pigment, whether the iron, they are going to be recycled. This is the hemoglobin molecule. It consists of four polypeptide chains, one, two, three, and four polypeptide chains of globin. as a protein, it means polypeptide, multiple amino acids uh, chain. And then each one of these chains has a heme pigment attached to it. And each heme contains one iron ion where one oxygen molecule is going to be attached. So in other words, each hemoglobin molecule can carry four oxygen molecules. This is the normal level of hemoglobin. Uh, we have 12 to 16 gram per 100 ml of blood in the female. In the male, it's more because, obviously, because males have more red blood cells than the females. Because they have more red blood cells, then they have more hemoglobin, because the hemoglobin is part of the red blood cell. Now, each hemoglobin can carry, as I said, four oxygen molecules, and hemoglobin also transports CO2. At part of the CO2, 23%, about one quarter of it is transported by the hemoglobin, but it is not transported by the heme portion. It is transported by the globin portion. So it's not going to compete with oxygen. The problem here is with carbon monoxide, which competes with the uh, site of attachment of oxygen, not carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. Most of the carbon dioxide is transported as dissolved in plasma, not in the uh, red blood cell. 
And this is uh, to tell you about anemia. It is reduction of oxygen binding capacity of the blood the, because of reduction of the amount of RBCs, the uh, reduction of amount of hemoglobin. So that's why oxygen does not reach the tissues as efficiently. The patient will become easily tired. There will be intolerance to cold weather. If it is, there is reduced hemoglobin, then the skin will be pale, especially the mucous membranes. If you look at the conjunctiva, you will find it is uh, pale, there is pallor. So these are the features of anemia. Now, this is how the production of red blood cells is controlled. You look at this uh, side of, of the slide. So whenever there is a reduction in the amount of oxygen delivered to the tissues, and one of the tissues is the kidney. The kidney, by the way, is an endocrine gland. There are endocrine glands, which are exclusive endocrine glands. They, are only in, they have no other function, like, for example, the thyroid gland. But there are many other organs in the body that have endocrine function as well as their, their other functions. There are cells in the kidney that secrete a hormone which is called hemopoietin. And this hemopoietin, it increases the process of production of red blood cells. So whenever there is a reduction in the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, then the kidney is going to produce the hemopoietin, and this will increase the amount of number of red blood cells, circulating red blood cells, and this will have a negative feedback mechanism. Blood doping can be um, in different ways, either by injecting, injecting blood, like having more and more blood transfusions. So this increases the amount of red blood cells and the amount, because the excess fluid that you have it from the blood transfusion, is, you are going to lose it, it's going to be lost. But what re remains is, is the amount of RBCs. So there is increase in the amount of RBCs in the blood if you continue injecting blood. And this will make the, the oxygen carrying capacity higher. And that is uh, how it was. Uh, now it is banned. It is illegal. But some of the athletes were using it before to increase their oxygen carrying capacity. Or they can inject a synthetic product which mimics the erythropoietin. So they will produce more and more uh, RBCs. But there is another method here which is quite intelligent. It's natural blood doping. And that is how they do it. The athletes, they train in high altitudes, in areas that are like on, to, on a top of a mountain. And on a top of the mountain, usually if you live on the top of the mountain, gradually you have increased in the amount of red blood cells because the amount of oxygen in the air, in the atmospheric air, is less than the, at sea level. So you will have naturally, because of this feedback mechanism of erythropoietin, that you are going to have more red blood cells in your blood to increase the oxygen carrying capacity. So those athletes will go on the top of the mountain, they will train there, they will have more naturally formed red blood cells, and then they will compete at sea level. Okay, so they have more stamina, let's say. But the problem here is that the increased amount of red blood cells increases the viscosity of the blood. So the blood has becomes easily clotting and um, it forces the heart to work harder and harder. That's why it is so dangerous to do this. Here's a, an optional video of a story of an athlete who was using these uh, injecting medication to increase the amount of red blood cells in his blood. Thank you.